everybody, welcome. We are live from Las Vegas. I am Susie Gronsa. I am at the University of Houston, and I want to welcome um, all of my students from the University of Houston that are joining us right now live via Zoom, and then say hello to everybody that's uh, watching this after the fact. Um, I am joined by a number of other outstanding people. Um, we, we are here to have a conversation with Dr. David Merrill. And uh, <laughs> we're going to get to know him a little bit better uh, during this session, but I want to give you guys a chance to introduce yourselves. Hi, everyone. My name is Nina. I'm from, uh, I'm working at Penn State now. And welcome you uh, to this session. And I'm Kurt Buck, and these are two fantastic Indiana University graduates that I'm with here today. <laughs> and with the leader, I, I, I would undoubtedly say the person who I read the most in graduate school, and because I was reading Charlie Ray's green and yellow books, and so of course we were reading David Merrill. And then uh, unfortunately we had a chance to chat with him with one of my classes about a decade ago or a little over, but it was virtual. It's nice to be live with David in yeah. studio. Yeah, very Coming to you live from Studio 101 in Las Vegas. Uh, or 11, Studio 11. Studio 11. Studio 11. Studio 11. <laughs> and, uh, here on October 22nd, uh, 2019. I'm really happy to have you come uh, here. My classes on um, dissertation proposal writing and my class on introduction to instructional technology foundations. Thank you. So I have a class that is learning about um, instructional technology foundations. We're looking at Spectre's book, um, a variety of different models and theories. And then, as you can see, how you has uh, volume two, <laughs> green book. We've been looking at the um, chapters. Uh, Related to cognitive towards the beginning, um, including um, your ITP uh, theories, and they've read that. Um, we looked at her first principles of instruction as well, and, uh, and so we have people joining us from those classes. And then, tell us about what your classes. Uh, so I'm teaching and with data as about foundation of learning design technology. We are also reading like a big uh, book from uh, uh, Ritter book yeah, and Ralph Molina's. And Ellie Carter Sheldon. Yeah, and Ellie. Uh, so you're making it work harder. Two requests. If we could do this twice while during this hour, um, we've got to move so we can see if there's other people. There's people won't show up here. I'm just curious. So there's a lot of other folks. Wow. Okay. So you can see who's all in here. Uh, hi, Dan and Mary from my class. Danab and Andre and Mike. Houston, and Jing Wan, and Yu Zhao from Bloomington, and Sun Mei Solf coming from Stanford, and Sybil, right? Brenda, Aida, yeah. okay. Karen. So, anybody, you are welcome if you're even, you know, um, to unmute your mic from time to time and ask a question. And um, I think we're going to be starting with, with, with your questions because we already have a couple here in the chat window. So, Susie, you want to? Sure. Hello. Well, actually, you should introduce Dave. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Dave, you are retired, but uh, tell us a little yes. bit about um, about yourself. I, I really like people to get to know you about some of the the highlights of, of, of your career, but then also a little bit of the human interest side. So, oh, the human interest side yes. is uh, my greatest productions to date is uh, my grandchildren, which I have twenty eight, but most of them now are married. And I have, are you ready for this, 30 great-grandchildren. Wow. And uh, that's really hard for a guy as young as me. <laughs> uh, so that's, uh, that's occupies a considerable amount of my time these days. Uh, we love to have our big family. And that doesn't count my wife's family. As a second marriage for us 17 years ago, my, or 18 years ago, my wife passed away. And I married my current wife, Kate. And she brought a family as well. Wow. And in her case, uh, her last, her first, last grandbaby was born three years ago, uh, and the next grandbaby to, in her family before that was 19 years earlier. So her mm -hmm. son and his uh, bride uh, waited until they were 40 and decided if they were going to have children, they better hurry and get married. So they did at age 41 and had a baby. And uh, so she has this young, uh, she has a, this baby younger than my great grandbaby. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> Anyway, that's probably the most important part. Uh, the other part of my uh, frivolous life is I'm an avid model railroader. I uh, own a very large uh, railroad that fills up a big part of my upstairs room in my house. 
and uh, so uh, I escape up there and uh, run trains from time to time. But actually, I have uh, friends come and join me. We play railroad, and uh, so uh, it's more than one train. So. <laughs> Um, but we know uh, a lot about what you've done in uh, instructional design theory and how uh, your focus for, for your work has been to make learning more effective overall, right? And efficient, and efficient. And engaging. And engaging. The three <laughs> yes. Can you tell us a little bit about that focus? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, if you have to tell me stories, this may have to go on for a long time. Uh, <laughs> the, this all started when I was a missionary for the Church of Jesus Christ for Latter-day Saints, the Mormon Church. Uh, and uh, I, before that, I thought I wanted to be an engineer, so I'd had two years of pre-engineering courses. Uh, I didn't do super well in physics and math and things, but uh, anyways, when I was in that experience, we were going door to door teaching people in those days, and we were having lessons with people teaching about the church. And I just got frustrated with how bad the instruction how bad we were doing. And I used to tell people, I said, the church must be true because otherwise the missionaries had killed it a long time ago. Uh, it just, uh, and so it's, when I, as a result of that experience, I decided to go home to my girlfriend and I said, you know what, I think I'm not going to be a engineer, I think I'm going to be an educator. So that decision took place then. And I came home and married her. And uh, 10 days after I got home, by the way. So uh, that's another little interesting piece. <laughs> um, so she waited for me while I served for two years. So that was my first experience. Then I got into undergraduate in education. I majored in secondary education, but I had a, a math minor, but a psych major. And uh, I and I uh, student taught in reading and American history, which never, I never had a class in either one. And so I thought this is really terrible. And uh, I the, the classes I had in secondary education were so bad. Uh, and I just got frustrated. I told the professors, I said, okay, I think I'm done. I think I'm going to go sell insurance or something for a while in my life because I'm certainly not going to. I was fired twice, by the way, as a student teacher. Uh, and, uh, so, <laughs> so dealing with rejection. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so, so I, did, I, I probably won't survive the public schools. So maybe I'd do something else. Um, and he said, uh, the professor that I talked to said, well, you can do that. Or you could go get a PhD and change the field. And I said, well, I thought you had to teach for 10 years and then go to get a degree and be an administrator. And he said, no, 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 no. There are programs available now where you can go directly from a bachelor's degree to a PhD program. And he gave me the name of three schools. I think the University of Chicago, uh, Columbia, and the uh, University of Illinois. I applied to all three. Fortunately, it was accepted in all three. And I went to the one that gave me the most money, which is the wrong reason to accept graduate school. But it was very serendipitous because it also turned out to be the very best school. Um, and so there I found myself in, in graduate school. Um, I was assigned to a professor uh, who turned out to be absolutely fantastic, uh, Larry Scalero. Uh, and uh, as part of my graduate program, uh, we built one of the very first computer-based instruction systems that existed and did survive. Uh, we had Plato, who was also invented at the University of Illinois at the same time. Plato survived. Socrates took him like a died very early on. Uh, and, uh, but one of the things that changed my life there was B.F. Skinner, uh, business school. This is a written up. If you've read some of my books, you've probably seen this story. But uh, B.F. Skinner came, and uh, after his lecture, somebody asked him a question. He said, in your book, so-and-so, you said blah, 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 blah. And tonight he said, blah, 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 blah. And uh, there seems to be a contradiction. And Skinner says, hell, you think I believe everything I ever wrote? And for a little guy from Farmington, Utah, I said, holy cow, everything's not true? <laughs> I should have known that a long time ago as an undergrad, but I didn't. And uh, that really changed me a lot. And the next thing Skinner said really directed my life because he said, what I tried to do was to make as few assumptions as I could and see how much of human learning we can explain with those few assumptions. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh my goodness, uh, okay. And so then later in grad school, I started to realize that learning theory is not the same as instructional theory. Just because you know how people learn doesn't mean you know how to teach. Uh, I see that today, today we have, have brain-based learning. Uh, I think it's nonsense because knowing how the brain works has very little to do with how you instruct people. And uh, so I decided, Maybe in my career, I will build, I will make theories that Skinner's idea. I will make just a few assumptions to see if I can build a theory of instruction. 
which I spent most of my career trying to do. Uh, time, we messed around with computer-based instruction, obviously because of how it was started out. And so that's how it kind of all got started. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about yourself. That was, yeah. that was the question. I right. once worked with Bia Skinner's daughter and husband uh, at West Virginia University and briefly talked to Skinner on the phone before he passed away. Oh, did you? So. And as, uh, Julie Vargas, his daughter, who wasn't raised in the Skinner box in Bloomington. Um, yeah, exactly yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, we, the reason I ask is because um, some, of, some of my students have, have come from, well, all of my students have come from a variety of backgrounds. We have some that came from engineering and they picked up on some things that they had learned in undergraduate in their engineering courses when we were reading uh, about uh, your instructional transaction theory. And we were kind of wondering, did you have that sort of grounding and maybe that influenced um, your thinking somewhat? Yeah, I, well, obviously I, I, had, I had a math minor as a result of my engineering. Uh, there's another story about that, but I'll call that another time. But the, uh, yeah, I, I sort of, and, and I sort of, have a left brain, right brain orientation. Mm -hmm. I think my left brain says I like things to be concise and straightforward. And I was deliberately trying to build theory that is, one of the things after Skinner's talk, when I, in grad school, I said some theories were really tight and well mm -hmm. designed and other theories were completely fuzzy. And uh, so I, I wanted a tight theory. I wanted things that were tight. I wanted, I, I wanted prescriptions that told you what to do, not just have broad things like have a discussion. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, or I mean, we, we still have in this organization, we go around, look at the program, there's all kinds of broad, broad prescriptions, which really don't tell you anything mm -hmm. uh, and can be interpreted in a lot of ways. And so I, I was trying to do that, trying to build a, a theory. Mm -hmm. uh, my first attempt at that was uh, what we call component display theory. Uh, and because I was young, I invented all kinds of words to impress people, uh, <laughs> like, you know, expository generality, inquisitory instances. And, <laughs> like that. Now I just say, now I just say, tell, show, act, and do, you know, tell, show, and do. But, um, but anyway, uh, that was the kind of the first attempt. Uh, they, it, it kind of evolved and eventually became first principles. In the meantime, we also got involved with um, computer-based instruction. Uh, we, we had the opportunity to design the ticket system, uh, which is a, one of the first big uh, NSF projects. Uh, on uh, computer-based instruction. And one of the things I wanted to do there was, I said, we built all these tools, there's, oh, and it's the same true, there's nothing different now than then. We have all these tools for doing things. You know, we have, now you can, put, anybody can put stuff online. I mean, it's a simple piece of cake. Uh, you don't have to know any programming, you don't have to know much about computers to do stuff. And people put it online all the time. In fact, we all publish our own books now, don't we, on our telephone. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's very easy to put stuff online, but that doesn't mean it's going to be more effective. Uh, just because it's online doesn't mean it's, it, if it's crap before, it's still crap when it's online. And uh, so I, it's, I was interested then at that point in time, I said, could we build this system? Could we design this system so that the instructional strategies, how you interact with the student, how you present stuff and how the student interacts with what you present is already built into the system. And that the subject matter expert, in our case, mathematicians and English professors, could bring their content, put it in the system, but the system would know how to teach. Mm -hmm. And so that was what we tried to do. Uh, and uh, and Ticket, uh, we, that was a very interesting system. Uh, it also uh, it had with, built within it a expert system because we gave students three buttons. Uh, a, a example button, practice button, and a example button. And so we let them control their own strategy. Mm -hmm. So we said, you know, if you're gonna learn about pronouns, one of the things we taught them about, uh, you know, you're gonna learn uh, there, 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 for example, mm -hmm. in, in English. And uh, so we said, this, that's what this little lesson's about, there, there, there. And so then you can say, oh, I wanna see a rule mm -hmm. about that, or I wanna see an example, or I wanna see a practice problem. Mm -hmm. And you can choose as many practice problems, as many rules mm -hmm. you want. We also had an easy hard button so far. And when we presented that to the National Science Foundation, somebody said, um, that's really gonna be tough. How do students learn how to do that? How are they gonna do? What are they, what are they gonna do if they try to do that? Mm -hmm. And uh, I would happen to be at the blackboard at the time, I'm on our team member. And I remembered a lecture that I heard from Mary Stallier on a grad school. 
And in this lecture, he drew a circle. He said, this is a student. He drew a box. He said, this is a teacher. And he, inter and he drew a narrow down, narrow up. He said, the teacher will interact with the student. He'll present. The teacher the student will interact. So well, that's a, a teaching system. And he drew another box. And he said, this is the professor function. When it's not working, the professor will step in and change the strategy for the teacher. So I remembered that. And I said, oh. I'm standing in front of the group, in front of NSF. We've never mm -hmm. talked about this at all. I said, oh, what we're going to do is build an advisor mm -hmm. on this system. And when the student gets stuck and says, I don't know what to do next, uh, they're just going to push the advisor button, and it'll tell them what to do. And my, my team in the back were going, <laughs> you know, and I just kept talking. And they were furious with me, you know, and I'm in front of, it, you know, in front of our, uh -huh. our sponsor. And so after we got together, they just, they all yelled at me and said, what, what are you talking about? We don't know how to do that. Nobody knows how to do that. I said, yeah, I know how to do that. I said, we can make that work. We can do that. And then, so we, we did. Uh, it was one of the more trying periods of my life. But uh, <laughs> we actually built an advisor, uh, which later I learned after I started studying artificial intelligence, after the fact, much later, that this was an overlay system. Uh, we, we had an overlay, what we called the All-American Strategy. And what we did was compare where the student was with that strategy and then advise them to the next step mm -hmm. of the strategy. Um, and so it was a very sophisticated mm -hmm. system. When the system went public, uh, the people published it and made it commercial, said, we don't understand this at all, so they threw the advisor away. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, I don't know where we, how we got to there, but <laughs> <laughs> I told you if you start me telling stories, you're in trouble. That may not, you better ask me what you want to know. <laughs> Why don't you grab one or two of the okay. questions that have already been asked? So one of the first questions that came up in the chat had to do with the pebble in the pond model, okay. instructional design. And the compare the question is about comparing the first step to identify some typical problem that would represent the task that a learner would be able to do following instruction and how it would compare to a uh, design thinking model step of design, defining the problem. Is Dan there? Are you with us, Dan? Yeah, Dan you is mute there. your mic and say something? I'll try it. How's that? Yep. Yes. So, I, hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, doing this this afternoon. I had the chance to read that article over the weekend, Dr. Merrill. And, you know, with in business today, everyone's talking about design thinking. And I just was wondering if you could talk how they compare and contrast or is there a comparison between the two two models? Well, of course, you're assuming I know what design thinking is. You've got to be retired for more than that's ten years. That, uh, uh, that's that model of uh, uh, they, a five-step model of empathize, uh, define a problem, ideate, prototype, test. Everyone's talking about it in business today. And uh, to well, me, it, it sounds to me like you're very consistent. My my idea was very simple. I think objectives, as were defined by Mager and other people, writing behavioral objectives are not very useful. Uh, you know, we had a lot of books that came out and they all started with an objective. You read the objective and it's only understood after it's understood. I mean, you, you don't know what the objective means until you've studied the course because the objective uses terms you don't know already. And so I, I found objectives were kind of crazy. So what I said was, why don't we start? Well, first of all, I made the assumption that all good instruction should teach you how to solve a problem or do a complex task. Uh, and so for me, I just said solve a problem and I meant very broadly what that means. So I said, if, if the end of a course or an end of a piece of instruction, you're not able to solve some problem or do some complex test, then why on earth are you doing it? You know, and so, so I said, if that's the case, which I think it is, then the first thing you ought to do is to figure out when this course is over or this piece of instruction is over, what problem or what task will the student be able to do that they couldn't do before? And that's where you ought to start. And then what you ought to do is to show the student that task right up front, an example of the problem they're going to be able to solve, and say, "This is the, you're going to be able to do this when you get through. Let me show you how I solve this problem. And then you go from there. Then you teach them the component skills they need to solve the problem. And then you go to a new problem and let, let them try to apply it in a new problem and mm -hmm. so forth. And so you, you go through this sequence of problems, often arranged from the simplest version of the problem to mm -hmm. the most complex version of the problem. Uh, and along with that, the pebble in the pond also suggests kind of a, what we now call uh, rapid prototyping or has, what's the agile, I don't know, with all these terms now, it's the same thing. I said, yeah, it's the trouble with the ISD model, the Dick and Carey model, is that we, we create abstract descriptions of our content 
not the content itself. And I said, so why don't you just start with PowerPoint or something that's easy to use and build the stuff as you go. You know, and so the very first thing you ought to do is to create a problem and a demonstration of the problem and build that the very first thing you do in your instruction and then work from there. And so that was the idea. Now, if that's what design thinking is all about, uh, then yeah, they're the same. But I'm not an expert in design thinking, so I had a, I able to answer the question very Sounds like the detail. IG8, uh, you know, creating the drafts or the, the models would be an overlap to yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. One, may I ask one more follow-up? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, roulette or craps? Roulette or craps? Oh, roulette You're in or Vegas. craps here in, You're in Vegas. Vegas. <laughs> What's your... Uh... What's my preferred? What's bad my joke. Preferred? It was a bad joke. My preferred thing? Uh, I, I like to not throw my money away. <laughs> uh, I, I'm with you, Dr. Merrill. I'm with you. Thank you for answering my question. Um, Thank Sybil you. Sybil in my class asked a question earlier today. Um, Sybil, you want to meet me? Mike and ask it or I can ask it? Why don't you try it? Why don't you hit that blue button to see who's in the... Sure. The civil might have, might have left. She's not in here anymore. Yeah. Um, she asked the question, David, um, can you briefly describe the overlap between your first, first principles instruction and Gagne's uh, events of instruction, his nine events of instruction? Yeah, I'll probably answer the question different than that than you've asked, but uh, probably the most influential person on my career was Robert Gagne. Uh, in graduate school, one of my professors was a reviewer for the publisher of uh, Conditions of Learning. And uh, one day after class, I had written a paper called Two Kinds of Learning uh, for his class. And after class, he said, you would really be interested in this manuscript. And he handed me Bob Gagne's manuscript for Conditions of Learning, the 1965 version. So I read it in manuscript form, and I immediately wrote Bob Gagne, and I said, you have written the book I wanted to write. Mm. And that started a relationship between Bob and I that lasted for all of his life. And uh, we interacted a lot. I never, never had a class from him. He never had a class from me. Uh, we interacted on several occasions. Um, so basically, I guess I started with Bob Gagne, his, his events of instruction, his categories of learning. Uh, the very first paper I wrote that sort of led to first principles and uh, first to component display theory and then first principles uh, was a paper for the um, Review of Research and Education. It's an annual volume for AERA. Oh, uh, the, yeah, the very first volume that came out, uh, I had been out of school, uh, past my PhD, I think two years, three years maybe. Mm -hmm. And I got a phone call from Kuringer, who's the editor of that, and he said, uh, uh, somebody recommended you. They said, you're a bright young man. You just got your degree. We need somebody to write an article on instructional design and research and about instructional That's design. That's putting pressure in as a new guy. Uh, uh, brand new. And I, I, journal. Were you at BYU I, by I, that point? Or uh, yeah, I was at BYU. I, I had been at George P. Buddy for two years, and I was at BYU. It was about the second on that. or third year I was at BYU. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, yeah. And But, you know, being... I mean, I went to grad school on the same kind of assumption that, you know, I don't know what I'm doing, but I do it anyway. Um, <laughs> and so I said to him, I said, how long do I have? And he said, well, it's, it's due in October, I think it was, a, which was five, four months away. Uh -huh. And I said, how long have you known about this? And he said, oh, well, somebody else was trying to write this chapter and they failed. And they said, they've been working on it for nine months. <laughs> and I says, you get, so I, I have three, four months to do this? And he says, yeah, we need it in four months. Mm -hmm. And so I said, okay. So what I did first was gather up all of the research I could find on concept learning or problem solving learning because I didn't want to study parasociate learning or you know that kind of stuff. So I wanted something that had research that had something to do with real learning, mm -hmm. you know, what I thought was more academic kind of learning. Um, and then I looked at them and I said, and the big thing in that in most of those papers was discovery versus expository mm -hmm. instruction. And what I determined was that one man's discovery was another man's expository. You couldn't tell the difference in their descriptions. So the words were meaningless. And so at that point, it kicked in. My Skinner thing kicked in. Uh, my, well, my, my uh, born rubber boot, you didn't know that story. Oh, I know that story. You know that story. You can tell that story. That uh, my in. students that's might have watched that video. <laughs> and, uh, that's a long and, story, though. Yeah. That's a long story. And I can my, share and that the video fact, with mine. 
and the fact that I, uh, and the fact that my father was a landscape painter and told me I only needed three crayons uh, to paint any picture. <laughs> yeah. And so those things kicked in and I said, okay, I am going to come up with a way to describe all of these treatments that these people have in these. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to find a few terms that I can make to do it. And so I came up with those crazy terms. <laughs> I said, you can do it either, yeah. either tell something or show something, which I called expository and inquisitory. And you can either show a generality or an instance. And so I called expository, generality, inquisitory, and so that part of component display. That was written in that paper. Mm -hmm. uh, along with uh, Dick Boutwell was one of my students. He helped me write that paper. Well, mostly he'd make, he did a lot of the research on that mm -hmm. stuff. I wrote the paper. But, uh, and, that was, and then we also took Gagné's uh, categories and said uh, he left some things out. And so we expanded Gagné's categories of, of learning. And that was kind of the first step uh, toward where we went. And now mm -hmm. I've forgotten the question already. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> we were talking about that, that comparison there. Do we have anyone else from the audience that wants to jump in? Or it says uh, Anne, Anne says that she has a question. We do have time if you'd go like ahead. to go, go ahead, ahead and ask it. Hi, um, I'm actually at Wayne State with Mena and I'm a classmate of Dan's and what he asked sort of sparked something in my head. You mentioned something about um, task-oriented problem solving where you would show what the problem is and then explain how you got to whatever solution you were looking for. My question is, is do you find that there's different um, areas of work where that implementation method works better than others? Or is it as good to use that in an English class as it is to use it in a math or physics class? Okay, the answer to your question is, uh, I think it works in every area. But you're absolutely right. It's easier if I'm in a if I'm in an accounting class. I already know you're going to give me a thousand accounting problems, and you're going to have to go home and do all kinds of worksheets, and so it becomes just obvious what the problem is. But if I'm in an English class, it may not. I'll tell you a story about an English professor that I was working with, and I told him he needed to have a problem, and he said, "Well, I don't have problems in English." I said, well, "What do you have him do?" And he said, "Well, I have him read these stories, and then and then I ask him." I want them to do critical thinking about the story. And I said, I don't know what the heck you're talking about. And what does critical thinking mean? And he said, well, no, I wanted to see that in almost every story, there's the kind of surface story. And then there's a real underlining meaning that the author had, that the message he wanted to get across. And I tried to get them to see that message. And I said, oh, that's really interesting. I like that. I like that really well. And I said, so isn't that a problem? He said, no, it's not a problem. And I said, well, wait a minute. I said, well, tell me exam give me an example. And he said, well, we had him read A Man for All Seasons. And if you know that story about Thomas More. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, and he said, the underlying conflict was he had a moral conflict. He either had to do what he knew was right, or he had to do what the king wanted. And if he didn't do what the king wanted, it probably cost him his life. And so he had this real moral conflict. That's what the story is all about, is how you resolve this moral conflict in your life. And I said, that's wonderful. I says, and then what do you do after that? He says, what do you mean after I do after that? I said, we go on to the next story. And I said, no, 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 no. What, what do you, why do you have students read that? What do you hope they'll do? And he said, well, I hope they'll apply it in their life. And I said, okay, how do they apply it? He said, I don't know. And I just tell them to apply it. I said, do you think they do? He said, probably not. I said, then <laughs> are we just wasting our time? And I said, look, let me give you an example. I said, we're at BYU Hawaii. We have students from 85 different countries, and every student that comes here has to sign a returnability agreement, which says, I will return to my home country after I finish my degree and not immigrate into the United States, because that's, a lot of people use this stepping stone. I said, but 60% of our students do immigrate into the United States and don't stay true to that commitment that they made. I said, so why don't at the beginning of the semester, you have them write a, a little essay in your class on returnability. What do you think about returnability? And then after you've read Thomas More, why don't you say, you know, and, and not right after maybe, but a little bit after, why don't you say, I'd like you to revisit that essay you wrote on returnability, write a second essay on returnability, and see if in fact reading Thomas More made any difference in how they think about that. He said, oh, that's wonderful. I'll do that as a final exam. I said, no, that's what you should do about everything you read. <laughs> Find out why you're doing it. What do you want the student to be able to do when he gets done? How do you want them to change their life? 
and find some way to measure that. Uh, so that's, I, I keep forgetting the questions, but that's. No, you did good. You did good. That was exactly, because I was trying to figure out how, as an instructional designer, my background's in science and math, and so I have very specific problems. Yes. And I'm just trying to figure out the applicability to um, the places where I have no strengths or actually yeah, any real I, knowledge, like English and history. Yeah, no, I think English and history, psychology, philosophy, uh, you know, these, I've worked with professors in all these areas, uh, and you're right. When I say think of a problem, if you're a science teacher or a math teacher, you got no problem. You, you think of one. Except sometimes I say think of a real world problem in mathematics, especially. Because I said too much of mathematics is completely abstract. It's a, it's a game with numbers. And uh, so I, in, in, in math, I say, show me a real problem. Show me, you know, something that they're going to be able to do when they get out of here. Especially if you're not going on into engineering or something. You know, if you're taking calculus because you're going to be an engineer, that's one thing. But I think the curriculum's upside down, even in science. I think our curriculum's upside down. I think that general education courses should all be the final course in anybody's training. Mm -hmm. Because a general education course survives everything you should know. And you don't have any idea what you're doing when you're in that general education class in biology or physics or whatever. Uh, and, and it takes much later that you suddenly go back and say, oh, now I know what they were talking about way back then. And so it seems to me that what we ought to do, if you're in engineering, you ought to start out with an engineering problem. And then you say, oh, by the way, to solve this problem, you got to have a little different mathematics than you probably have. You probably can't just use algebra. Let me show you how to do this problem. And then we teach calculus in the context of solving the, the problem when you need it. So, uh, but so even there, I think that trying to make real world problems is the challenge in science and math. So they're not just abstract uh, problems. Uh, but, but you're right. Problems in English, uh, history, philosophy, religion. Uh, but I've had students do religion classes. My greatest challenge of all, I had a, a kindergarten teacher sign up for my class on first principles. And I said, hmm, I don't know uh, if this is really going to apply to five-year-old illiterate kids that can't read or write. Uh, and I, so I told her, I said, oh, I, I really, you're really brave to sign up for this class. I, it's really kind of gained more... A, adult learners, or at least, you know, beyond the Piaget formal stage, you know, like 12 year olds and beyond. And she says, oh, no, no, this will work perfect for kindergarten kids. And she developed probably one of the best first principle lessons I've ever seen on counting groups and how to compare groups to see who did something best. She actually did research in group comparison with five-year-olds, mm. all done in PowerPoint without a live teacher. Mm. Uh, and so I've come to the conclusion that, yeah, it applies everywhere. Mm. Uh, it may take a little more creativity in some areas, as you correctly identified, Anne, than in others. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. We've got Priyanka, and there's, um, who's the other one there? We should go to those two questions. I saw a big, long one from Priyanka up there. Scroll right down. Um, we have a question from Jing Wan and one from Fong. Yeah, let's do those two and then okay. I'll have a question. All right. So Jing Wan and Fong are, are also doc students that I work okay. with at the University of Houston. And Jing Wan says, <laughs> yeah, uh, I am reading an article by Elliot Eisner. He argues that educational objectives clearly and specifically stated can hamper as well as help the ends of instruction, especially for subjects such as arts education. What do you think about this argument and how do you feel about setting learning objectives before the instructional process? And do you want to unmute your mic and, and come on camera so we can see you and, and uh, you, want to, you want to rephrase the question at all? Jingwan, you can add a little bit more if you'd like. Can you see me? Hi. Hi. I'm here. I'm in my office. That's why I moved <laughs> my mic. Yeah. You, uh, I don't have anything to add. I mean, that's just my question because I have never thought about educational objectives can hinder the the instruction or the effective of instruction. So um, I think he mainly argues like for some subjects such as art education, where like objectives are not measurable in some way. So like so she argued that for subjects, subjects such as this kind of um, 
uh, such such as ours, education. Uh, I think her his point of view is to not have a specific or objective set up before the instruction happens. So I want I wonder to know what's your point of view, of view on this. Yeah, I have a strong point of view on that. I think objective uh, is a waste of time. Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I mean, they have a purpose in terms of helping a, a person know what their subject matter is. But this idea that we have these objectives at the front of our courses, I don't care whether it's art or anything else, oftentimes you have no idea what the objective means or what it says. And so, yeah, I, think, I don't think they contribute much. That's why I went to the point where I said, show me, I'm going to show you a problem or a task that you're able to do. Now, if I'm in art, I can do the same thing. I'm going to say, you know, I... I'm not an art teacher. My father was an artist. Uh, but, you know, I, I have some goal in mind. Now, you know, I may want you to be creative. I may not want to hinder you. But certainly there are things that I want to acquire. And so I say, I want you to paint a picture that expresses some emotion. Let's say that's pretty ambiguous. You know, I want you to paint a picture that expresses great love. Uh, and so, you know, you paint that painting. And let me show you how I might have done that. You know, and so let me, let me show you a painting I painted, and let me analyze that painting for you. And now let me show you another painting. Here's another person that did it a completely different way, and let me show you that. Mm -hmm. And let me show you this, and let me, show, let me just talk about the techniques that they used, and so forth. And now I want you to paint a picture, and, I, you know, and then you tell me the techniques that you used, so forth. That, I think, would work. And, that, and so, okay, I got rid of the objective. I don't have to have a full objective to say, the student will be able to, blah, blah, blah. And here's the way I'm gonna measure it. You know. Uh, how do I measure that when they're all done, you know, that it really shows love? Well, that's, that's a little tricky as well, uh, especially in that kind of a situation. But, uh, you know, you can say, okay, we're going to put it out. We're going to have some people look at your art after, and we're going to have them re respond to it. How did this picture make you feel? What did you think about when you did this picture? You know, I'm, I'm going to get some data. Is there a right or wrong answer? No. Uh, but does that help? Yeah, that helps. But uh, like in my practice, um, when we help some instructors to design their course, the first thing that we want to see is their objectives. If they're not, like we, we, we use backward design, so we want to see their objectives first. And then based on that, we want it aligned with um, teaching activities and the okay, assessment. Me, so that, that's- let me, suggest, like, let me suggest where you go with that. Uh, <laughs> You, you, you're, you're the perfect example. I agree with you. You start at the end and come back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah. the end, the end it shouldn't be a test. Uh, you know, a, that's ridiculous. A, a multiple choice test or something isn't going to do anything. What I want to do is I want, I want them, I want to show them the problem they'll be able to solve when they're done. So why don't we start there and say, here's the problem you're going to be able to solve. And now let's move backwards. Say, what do you need to learn in order to learn how to solve that kind of a problem? And not only that, I want you to solve several versions of that problem. So for the, you know, let's, and, or maybe I'm going to petition the problem out and you're going to solve pieces of it as we go along. Uh, mm -hmm. And so rather than objectives, which are kind of abstract and hard for professors, especially, or for teachers, especially to write, tell them, ask them, what, what do you want this student to be able to do? What kind of a task do you want this student to be able to do and they get through the course? What kind of a problem do you want them to solve? Show me, don't tell me, mm -hmm. show me the problem. Show me how you would solve a problem. Show me how you would think a student would solve a problem. Show me a problem and how the student would solve. Great. That's where we start. Mm -hmm. And now let's move back from there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Very, by, uh, Very helpful. The objective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think Priyanka did have a question. Yes. And Priyanka is what, from India. She just moved from Dubai to Adelaide. Oh, Priyanka, really? can you unmute your mic and go ahead and ask that question? Hi. Hello. Yeah, you got. Am I? Yep, we hear you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so my question was, um, what issues do you think exist today in learning and are important to you today, and you would fight for? And what do you? What kind of transformations have you seen happen over the years? And you would say, oh, those amaze me. Uh -huh. We're supposed to be inspired here uh, at this okay. conference. Yeah, that is right. Inspires the word. Right. Inspires the word. <laughs> well, let me be uninspiring for a moment. Uh, my greatest concern 
is that I've been interested in effective instructional strategies my whole career. Uh, I pushed hard to help develop instructional effective strategies, to teach effective strategies, to research to see if they work. But uh, I, there are at least three or four major studies that have been done on first principles of instruction, which is my version of effective strategies, of course. Uh, one of them was done by some students, four international students at, at Utah State University. So one from Turkey, one from China, forgot where the other one was from, one from the United States. And they looked at all the courses they could find online on marriage, on, on effective marriages. And they limited to courses that were written by uh, clergymen or by marriage counselors or, you know, not just run-of-the-mill kinds of people. They wanted to have uh, really people that knew what they were talking about. And then they looked at these to see to what extent they implemented first principles. They had a seven-point scale. And the mean of all of those was 0.1, 0.1, meaning that only a few of these many, many courses even used any of the first principles of instruction. So migrated, and another story was done by Anash Margarian. Uh, she is in, uh, she was in Scotland, I think she's in England now. Uh, she did her, her uh, PhD at the University of Sventa. I had the opportunity to be an outside member on her committee. And she did a big study on first principles on MOOCs. She looked at 76 MOOCs. Uh, big, did you read that study, yeah. Curtis? Uh, and, and again, she looked at even more carefully than this first study in terms of the scale that she used to see to what extent uh, MOOCs use first principles. And what she found was they almost don't. There's a lot of these MOOCs that claim to teach applications, uh, problem solving skills, but when they look at them closely, they didn't implement the, the appropriate strategies. So my, my, my uninspirational comment is, my concern is we know, what, we know good strategies, not just mine, but other people as well. We know good instructional strategies. We don't see them, we don't use them. Uh, and in fact, as it's, it's become easier and easier to put things online, we see even less and less effective instruction. So that's my most uninspiring thing. The most inspiring thing to me is we now have on our, in our pocket technology that exceeds all the technology in the university when I went to, mm -hmm. as an undergraduate. I am just blown away by the capabilities we have. Uh, and with simple things, I, my favorite thing to do is to take a, a PowerPoint which is often belittled and said it's really terrible, and to show people that you can make PowerPoint fly. Uh, I, like, I love to take teachers and show them, hey, you should be using PowerPoint in your classroom. And not only that, you can do simulations. You can do all kinds of stuff with PowerPoint. And it's not hard. Uh, there's, it's, and so most people use 1% of the capability of this wonderful tool. Uh, it's just like word processing. Most people use 1% of their word processor. Uh, but we have these phenomenal tools that we can almost simulate almost anything. We can get almost any level of interaction. Uh, somebody asked me the other day, can you teach anything on, on the computer? And I said, yeah, I think so. Almost anything, you know? And, uh, and I could give you examples that, of students that I, one of my favorite examples was a student, uh, I had them all design effective instruction, but I didn't give them restrictions. And when they turned them in, I said, oh, I forgot to tell you, I wanted this course to be online. And one of the students did a course as how to teach a little league shortstop how to play his position in, the, in baseball uh, and how to position himself uh, to where the ball's coming and so forth. And I said, oh, that was a fantastic lesson. I mean, it was really, really good. And I said, really great. I said, except that, I forgot to tell you, I want it online. I want you to be able to teach it to 50 people simultaneously. Uh, on, he said, that's impossible. This is a lesson for a coach. I said, then put your coach in the computer. And he said, this is not possible. I said, then I'm not hiring you. Uh, you know, you can't, be, you can't work for me. I want it online. And he said, well, that's not reasonable, Dr. Merrill. And I said, no, that's, uh, we're, I'm challenging you. I want you to figure it out. Well, he complained. He called me a couple of times on the phone and says, no, this is not possible. That's not. I said, well, okay, that's all right. I won't hire you. 
they go, well, you didn't give me a grade? And I said, yeah, I won't penalize you, but uh, I'll, do, I'll give you a lot better grade if you put it online. <laughs> and so uh, we fell silent for a while. And about a week later, uh, he came to class one day and he said, I've got it. I said, okay, great, show me. He said, well, let me show you. So he takes his computer screen, he sets it up, and he said, now we're going to step back this many feet from the computer. He says, now I want you to get down in this position. He kind of put your hands on your knees and squat down like a, a shortstop would. And he said, I want you to scream because I, this picture was taken from the, where the shortstop would be on the field. And you can see the pitcher, and you can see the batter down here, and you can see, you know, and what I want you to watch is I want you to watch that pitcher and I want you to watch his windups because that'll tell you what, how he's going to throw that ball. Then I want you to watch the batter, and I want you to see how he positions himself to swing because that will help you tell where that ball's coming. And then I want you to get ready to catch that ball when it comes. And so then he had all these scenarios like this. It was phenomenal. Was it better than a coach? Probably not. But it, it did demonstrate to me that if you're really creative, you can use this fantastic technology we have to do almost anything. So that's what I think is the miracle. I'm amazed every single day when I pull my phone out of my pocket. I remember at USC when Bob Casey, one of our professors, came back from a conference. This was now got to be the 1980s probably. Um, and he came back from a conference and he said, we will be able to take pictures with our phone. We will be able to do uh, communicate with one another uh, over our phone with pictures. Uh, and we'll be able to take movies with our phone. And we all said, you got to be kidding me. You know? <laughs> the phone's in a bag. That's yeah. Like this big. Well, we didn't, we, didn't, you know, we didn't have anything in that point. And there was none of it. There was none of it at that point in time. He also came previous to that and said, you're going to get all your televisions from satellite. Uh, so he was out on the cutting edge, of, you know, with uh, Xerox and other people who are doing the research on this stuff. And so I pick up this phone nowadays and I say, this is a miracle. This is absolutely incredible. There's so many things we can do. And, and in fact, I never have arguments with my wife anymore. She always used to tell me I was wrong. Uh, and now she doesn't. She just says, Siri, what's the answer to this? And then she shows me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your question. So we had, that was maybe the other question. We'll probably do a Wayne Steve or yeah. a Houston question. And remember, I have one at the end here. Uh, we have about 10 minutes or 15 left. Um, so who should we go with? Mm, I want to go with Mike. Mike, how about you uh, unmute your mic? Are you still on? Here? Hello, can you hear me all right? Houston Mike is from Houston. Hello. Yeah, so um, a few weeks back when we went through your chapter in the Green Book, um, I'm the strange grad student who started out in an engineering program. Um, and I wound up looking at the uh, example of a potential procedurally generated, so to speak, instructional module with the uh, look to be some form of an engine valve or a, a structural uh, transmission valve of some kind. Okay. Um, and the one thing that I noticed just from long-term experience in computer engineering, electrical engineering, um, other, you know, hobbyist fields and others that I've dealt with over the years is that there's a underlying assumption, I think, with that sort of procedural generation that the documentation is available and is very well written <laughs> um, in order to provide all of the building blocks for what that generating program would then have to address in order to generate the program. Yep, you're right. <laughs> and just from personal observations over the years, it seems like in, in open source programming, in computer design, uh, even in modern automotive design, that doesn't seem to always hold up. Um, you know, so many things are locked behind either just lousy commenting in the code or incomplete documentation after the fact or trade secrets. Um, the example I gave Dr. Gronset the other day, uh, up until last summer, I was driving a 1997 Mustang. Uh, and there's a very weird failure mode in it where at a certain point, 
the radiator fan no longer spins correctly, not because the fan's gone bad, but because between all of the wiring and all of the proto computer signaling in the relay board, it no longer receives proper voltage. Um, and the accepted way of fixing this out of Ford is literally a ship of Theseus sort of replace every part until it works again. Of course. <laughs> um, the undocumented, at least from Ford, but highly documented in the hobbyist community way of doing it is run some new wire and add an override switch. Yeah. But you would never know that unless you understood the system much better than even the original Ford engineers. And so your point is? <laughs> um, so I feel like, like I said, there's the, the idea of the procedurally generated educational modules. While I feel it has merit, I think it just rests on this base assumption that we've got incredibly good documentation going in. Well, one of the things that we found in playing with people and trying to build simulations, and what we did, and that's a whole other topic, uh, was one of the things I'm very interested in is, is representing knowledge so that it could be computed upon. And uh, so some of the little simulations that we built, we did that. But what we found is when we worked with the subject matter expert and helping and trying to, get, to, to give us the very information that we needed to build the simulation, uh, they, they, they would say, oh, I hadn't thought about that. And then by the time they get through, they said, this was very helpful. I now understand the system better than I, you know, than I did before. Uh, even though I was an expert in the system, yeah, you forced me to think about what happens here, and you know, and then I had to figure that out. And so I think that the very act of building these simulations or figuring out the content that we need, as you said, and you're absolutely right, documentation and all this stuff is terrible. Uh, is that, is that really helped uh, the 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 design? And so I think the same some of the same tools we use to build these things can also find their way back into the design stage of these kinds of, of activities where they, they do, be, do, find be, do better job at actually building and designing this thing that they're trying to do. I don't know if that's where you're going with this, but, but you're right. I, I, I don't, it's, yeah, I, I, we often teach things we don't know. Uh, that's one of the things I started to build simulations with people. Uh, I, I, just, I, I came up with this, the solution, most subject matter experts aren't. They, they really don't know their subject matter. And when you start to really push them to get the data, the content that they need, the content that we need to build something like that, uh, it really pushes them to say, oh, wait a minute. And, and they forces them to think about things that they just skip over because they're able to do it you know, sort of intuitively, or they don't know how they do it, or they haven't thought it through. But all of a sudden, you start to make it very explicit in a system, then it forces them to think through it, and, and, and they become better subject matter experts. Mm -hmm. Okay, in terms of uh, Wayne State people. Um... Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I'm sure, I'm not sure whether Susan Sue has any question. Susan Medley? Are you there? Are you there, Susan? Hi, I am here. All right, Do we can hear you. <laughs> well, so I was interested to hear the math conversation. I teach high school math, and I, I was trying to think through your idea on objectives of showing them the problem that I'd like them to be able to do at the end. And I really do struggle with finding real life problems that are relatable to high school people because they just, they don't really pay bills yet or design anything. And I wondered if you had, um, if you had any suggestions for real world when you're not really in the real world yet. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I, again, some of the best courses that I had uh, some of my students do, I've, I've had some math teachers. And uh, one was, uh, now I gotta think whether she was talking about, wow, uh, it was a ge geometry problem. Uh, but anyway, what she did, I remember the example she came up with was designing an irrigation system. And so instead of just you know drawing lines on a paper, she had them design an irrigation system, which required them to dissect angles or something. I don't remember exactly what the sure. content was. Uh, and, but 
Uh, and you know, no, none of these students had ever designed an irrigation system before, but it was a real world problem. It was a, it was a problem that they could conceive that they might have to do or might be able to do. And they found it much more interesting. So I think that's the challenge. And I agree with you, it's not always easy to find those applications because oftentimes mathematics is so abstract. We teach it so abstract, which is one of the things that makes it really hard. But if we can, if we can bring it down to say, you know, even though they may not have had experience with the real, if it's a real world situation that they can imagine themselves being in, then yeah. you're actually teaching two things. You're teaching them, you know, a little bit about how to design an irrigation system, but the real purpose was to teach them the geometry underneath. Thank you. You're welcome. And by the way, those, I, if you send me an email, I can send you a copy of those PowerPoint, the, the PowerPoint lesson that this woman did that might help you. Oh, okay, terrific. Thank you. I will do that. My email is simple. It's Professor Dave Merrill at Gmail. Oh, excellent. Okay, because I'm simple and I need simple. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Back when I worked in the business world, my boss, the controller, I was assisting controller, he said, keep our password simple. So my password was simple and he was Simon. Uh, wouldn't work today. No one let us get away with that. No, you'd, ha no, you'd, have, to, you'd have to put a couple of symbols yeah, in there, yeah. capitalize one of the letters. Yeah. So, Dave, a um, couple of the students in here have been reading your article in Ellie Karchelman's book. So, Wayne State students have read it, and Indiana students have read it. And they've been uh, debating it with a tool called Nuclino, which is like a collaborative tool to debate. So, they read your, the, the, the article from you, they read the rejoinder. They read the response and all that, and, and they wrote up some questions for you. And I, I think I'll focus on the ones that relate to programmatic things, the two questions. First one, undergraduate programs in this field are starting to emerge in the States. They've already been in Korea and in Taiwan, China, but the emphasis on undergraduate program instructional design, could you talk more about the inroads that have been made in your lifetime, especially the past decades in that regard? And if there's not been, what could AECT, this conference, or ATD do um, in terms of forming a working committee or whatever, what, what, what do you think the potential is for undergraduate uh, in, in degrees in this field? And what, what would people study? Okay, the last question is the easiest to answer. The former question is about what's happening. I, I Keep in mind, I'm retired. I don't try to keep up anymore. Uh, so I'm, I'm not, you know, I can't tell you what's happened in the last decade. But, uh, uh, you know, I do know that there are some undergraduate programs. I know that I just talked to somebody from Utah State, which I... I'm emeritus professor, but that means I, I use the library. I don't know anything else what's going on. Uh, and uh, they, they apparently have an undergraduate program now in instructional technology. My argument, what I, what I was after was really, it seems to me that our graduate programs, it seems to me that taking a master's degree in learning to do instructional design, design instruction, uh, is not a very good use of our manpower, number one. And, and number two, if you get a master's degree in instructional technology and you go out into business and industry, the chance that you're actually going to design instruction is probably very low. What you're going to be is a manager and you're going to get a whole bunch of designers by assignment to assign to you and they're going to design the instruction and they haven't had the training you've had and you're going to be frustrated because their designs are going to be crappy or not as good as you'd like. I should say that. I should say crappy. They just won't be as elegant as you would like. Uh, so it seems to me that, that instead of teaching our master's students to uh, design instruction, we ought to move that down to an undergraduate level. So somebody could take my book on first principles as an undergraduate uh, and do very fine with it in terms of designing instruction. The only opportunity I had to do that was when I was at BYU Hawaii, I taught an undergraduate class in instructional design and their designs were as fantastic as my master's students. So I know that they can do that. And the master's students really ought to be building intelligent tools that know how to teach and that can be used by designers by assignment who are subject matter experts to bring their content and not have to worry about how am I going to present that to the student? How am I going to have the student interact with it? How am I going to grade it? That all ought to be built into the system. And we need uh, more opportunities for building students. So I think that's what the the master's students ought to do. They ought to take what they know about instructional science, about, uh, about learning, about uh, instructional design, and they ought to build tools for designers by assignment. Then that push up to the PhD program, and the PhD program ought to be research on instructional design. What works? Why does it work? How is it related to learning? All of those kinds of more 
more difficult questions. Uh, and then the master's students ought to study that and turn that into tools. And then the undergraduates ought to learn how to use those tools and teach others to use those tools. That's kind of my, my goal. And I don't think that is happening. I think there is some undergraduate program or teaching instructional design. I don't know that master's programs are changing in the way. I haven't seen any tools uh, or very many tools developed by master's students. So the other parts of that, there are PhD, yeah, there are PhD programs that really are doing the kind of thing I'm talking about, but there's even PhD programs that are teaching people to design instruction and at a level I think should be undergraduate. That's a good one. And you've, you've covered my second question already, so we can move on. Manny, do you have a question, please? Uh, I have several uh, doctor students who are trying to figure out their research areas and uh, one of the students she mentioned she is worried about if she's doing some research that will be outdated once she graduates, then do you have any suggestions for the graduate students who are trying to figure out their research areas? My observation is that the chance in this field of having your stuff outdated is very low uh, because we don't know very much. <laughs> It's not like math and science where it gets passed over. So I think anything you do is likely to be have some lasting value. Uh, I mean, the work that I did on first principles dates way back 50 years now. Uh, I think that some of the first papers I wrote are as relevant today as they were then. And the reason is, is because we're still not doing it. We're still not using all these things that we could. Uh, and what was the other first part of your question then? Yeah, yeah, that's a general question about it. You've got it. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, is there questions? Uh, final one or two, or anything else, Susie? Let's see. Does anyone want to unmute your mic? Go ahead and unmute your mic and then talk. Put your camera on if you want. Okay. We have a question about programs and systems replacing instructors. Who is that? <laughs> that was from Fong. Okay. Could the program system limit peer interaction or perhaps interaction with an instructor? Fong, you want to unmute your mic? Oh, can you? Do you have access to a microphone there, Fong? Well, she said that it was noisy. Where oh, okay. Was, so. okay. So what, what's the question again? Uh, well, you know, when people talk about uh, computer-based oh, okay. instruction are, are we replacing are we replace the, teachers? Yeah, replacing yeah, the teachers. No, that's a common question. I don't, I, yeah, it's a common question. I don't think the answer is, I don't think there's much worry about that. Uh, I, I think that, I, I think what it does, well, let, let me in my own case. Um, I, I've been teaching online now for probably the last 15 years now, I guess. I, boy, time goes by fast. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Uh, and I, I worried a little bit about that, and I, but I decided, uh, I love to lecture, by the way. I'm an entertainer, and not as much as Curtis is, but, I'm a, <laughs> but I love to lecture. I love to be in front of students. I love to, to take questions in real time. But I decided when I was online, I said, it doesn't make sense to can lectures. Uh, what I want to do, if people can read, uh, I've written very carefully a number of articles and books. And I said, so I, when I taught the class online, I said, everything that you need to know to do this class is in the textbook or in these articles or these other sources or these other examples that I put online for you to look at. Uh, all the stuff you need to do is there. It's very well organized. Uh, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you assignment every week that makes you do something. You have to do something. You have to apply something every week. So you're gonna learn some skills and you apply it every week. And then I'm gonna go through, my contribution is I'm gonna review what you've done and provide detailed feedback to you on what you've done, uh, because that seems to be the, the contribution that I need to make here. Now, in that case, what's changed is that the time and effort I would have spent presenting stuff is now can be spent in, in providing personalized feedback to people. Or if I get too many people, then what I, would, what I did a couple of times when I had very big classes was to say, I will, I will provide detailed background on a sample of what you've submitted. It's because I can't possibly get through all of them, but I'll do a sample. Or I've had students evaluate each other and then I've evaluated the evaluation, again, sampling to, to see what's so. So I, again, I think there's a changing role. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that uh, there's plenty of to do for a teacher to put courses online uh, you, you, I don't know about everybody else. I'm never satisfied, so I keep revising it every time I ever do it. 
uh, there's plenty of opportunity to do all of those kinds of things. And so I, it seems to me that uh, that's, uh, I, I don't think there's a danger. Uh, and, you know, if there is a danger, then let's make them designers and design courses. You know, so it really and, challenges us to maximize the time that we have with the students oh, yeah. during the course instead of using the time to deliver content that they can access. Yeah, there's, there's access open resources somebody, and somebody else. Yeah, there's you provide uh, that feedback, all kinds of stuff, you know, whether it's your resource or somebody else's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In your rejoinder to that article, you talk about universities being more flexible and in inviting experienced practitioners as instructors. At, at Wayne State, it's an urban campus, might be more easy to do. At Houston, it's an urban campus. Bloomington's a rural campus, and we, we don't have as many, but we have some. But is there a, a, a balance here in terms of experienced you know, uh, practitioners versus having professors uh, traditional? As, uh, what, 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 what do you see? Um, and why did you make that comment about uh, ex inviting experienced practitioners as part of faculty in, in order to, uh, I think you said, in order for professional experiences and ideas outside the tra traditional curriculum to enter in, to, to move and push them a little bit? Yeah, uh, well, I, I, there's several thoughts here. Uh, one thought is um, we are so hung up on numbers and requirements in graduate schools and other places uh, driving me crazy. So I'll just tell you a couple of examples. Uh, Andrew, Andrew Van Schaak uh, was a entrepreneur, worked in Japan. They developed a lot of uh, really interesting technology things. One of the things they developed was a pen that would immediately send it to a computer. Mm -hmm. So you're writing and it yeah. would print it out on the computer. They, they helped develop that mm -hmm. technology. I worked with them as a consultant a little bit. And one day we were talking, he said, Dr. Morell, you're my ideal. And I said, thank you very much. He said, no, I want to have, I want to be a professor like you are. And I said, great, come on and get a PhD with me. And he said, well, I have one problem. I said, what's that? And he said, I don't have an undergraduate degree. Mm. I said, I said, I just went to work. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, you know, you're one of the more talented people I've ever met. So I said, I can't guarantee that I get you in, but I will make the effort. I will, I was, I'll take the graduate dean. I was a friend of mine, he's going to tell me I'm crazy, mm -hmm. but uh, we'll, we'll do it. So I did. I went and pushed, I went to the graduate dean, and he said, oh, this is, you know, this is pretty tough. I said, yeah, you got all those clerks under you that are going to say, oh, well, no, you know. <laughs> and he said, well, you know, and, and he said, well, you seem like a really intelligent guy. And I said, yeah, he is a very intelligent guy. I've worked with him for three or four years. I worked for him, by the way, yeah. <laughs> you know. And, uh, and so he said, well, I don't know how we can do this. And so Andy said, well, I'll tell you what. He says, if you'll let me take whatever classes I want, I'll be happy to take the hours mm -hmm. uh, to finish my undergraduate mm -hmm. degree. And it did hit that a couple of years, maybe more than that. Uh, and he said, but if you'll let me just take the classes I want, so I have to have some super measure. Then I'll, and so they finally agreed to do that. Well, in three and a half years, they finished a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a PhD. Wow. <laughs> wow. Know? And so that's, you know, and he's, he's a professor now at Vanderbilt University. I think he's probably a full professor by now. Wow. I had another- what area is he? Uh, He's, he's in instructional technology. I'll have to look him. What's his yeah. name? Uh, and Andrew Van Schack. Uh, he also did a very interesting thing. I taught a class on project management. And uh, so he signed up for the class. He had to have the credit because he's trying to get his PhD. Yeah. And I said, this is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> You've been managing projects your whole life. You know more. Said, well, I, well, let me teach it. I said, okay, great. You know, <laughs> I'll, I'll take the credit as a student. But I said, yeah, you teach this guy. I said, okay, well, I want to do it a different way. And I, he said, you've been bringing, you always bring a, a, a client in from the outside and have them present a, you know, this is a problem I want to design an instruction for. And then you have them divide the class into teams to design and have a competition so you can design the best instruction for this problem. He said, but I want it a different way. I want to have teams, I want them to find a product out there that they think they can make better. And I want them to make a prototype and make it better. And then we want to sell it back to the company. Mm. And I said, oh, wow, well, that's pretty good. <laughs> well, the, the one thing they did do that was very successful is, you know, apples to apples. That uh -huh. shop, they took apples to apples and made an apples to apples version for the GRE. Okay. And then they called up Milton Bradley or whoever, uh -huh. they, whoever did it, and they sold it back to Milton Bradley. Milton Bradley said, this is amazing. They're all receiving royalties to this day. Oh. <laughs> wow. And I said, you know, so that's so Andy. Smart. All right. So. So the answer to the question is, you know, oh, I'll give you another answer. Woman, I was at, at uh, USC, California, and this girl came into my office, woman came into my office, and she said, 
I want to take your instructional design class, your advanced instructional design class. I say, great. He says, well, I'm not admitted to the program. And I said, well, that's not my problem. I, you know, she said, well, will you let me take the class? I don't care. Mm -hmm. I says, you know, you know, audit, it's fine. She said, well, I'll audit the class. But she said, uh, I want you to treat me just like any student. I want you to, I'm going to turn in all the projects. I want you to grade everything. I said, look, let me tell you, I don't keep track of all this nonsense that the university makes you keep track. If you come into the class and I see you every day and you turn in assignments, I'll forget that you're not it. <laughs> and uh, she said, okay. And so that's what she, that's what she did. She did an excellent job, really excellent. So after she came and she said to me, uh, how did I do? And I said, well, you know how you did. You had the top two or three in the class. I said, outstanding project. She said, good, would you write a letter to that effect? And I said, sure. What she had done is they turned her down because of her scores, they wouldn't let her in grad school. And so she went to the three professors that, she asked everybody, who's the hardest class? Who are the hardest class? Put three hardest classes, took their classes, took the class, then she took the results back to the admissions people and said, all right, people, I just proved that I can pass the three best classes. You know, now can I get in, please? And she did and got her PhD. My argument is we're too hung up on formality. Yes, definitely and, uh, so. And uh, I just I just heard a session from Tammy, what's her name, uh, this morning. She had a workshop. Uh, let me just find her name. Is Tammy something? I'm all, often we have prereqs, and, and and students are won't take a class, you know, because it's a prereq. Tammy Bean. Yeah. Uh, Cammy Bean, she used to a book called The Accidental Design, Instructional Designer. She has no degree. <laughs> and so, and, you know, and I, if I was a Bean and she came around, I'd say, yep. <laughs> I'll hire you in a minute, you know. And so that's, that's yeah, part yeah. of it. I that, just, that's a great answer. I just think that, you know, we put too much stress on. The other thing, I, I had students walk into my office and uh, I asked him to walk in my office and he, he said, I really want to get in your program. And I interviewed him, talked to him for a while. And I said, oh man, you'd be great. I'd love to have you. And uh, and, he, and he came back and he said, um, I just failed the GRE uh, and they won't let me in. And I said, kind of scored GRE. Well, it was low, but it wasn't terrible. And I said, I don't think that'll make a difference. And so I petitioned and got screamed at and yelled at. And But I said, I want this student. Well, you are responsible for him, man. Uh -huh. I said, I'll be responsible. I, I'll take my chance because I think he'll do anything great. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So it just seems to me that we need to be attentive to people, mm -hmm. who they are and what yes. they can do. And, you know, and this too much academic kind of stuff. What was one of your questions early? No. You know, oh. practitioners versus yeah. academics. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that, you know, I'm very fortunate in my own career to have an opportunity to do lots of consulting yeah. in lots of different contexts. Uh, so you kind of have a fit in both, both doors. And yes. I think that's important. Yeah. Uh, somebody just stays in the ivory tower the whole time. I think that makes it a, a challenge. But. Yeah. We're, We're running out of time. Yes. So do we, any final, Susie, do you have any final comments or things or th we haven't covered yet? Uh, no, I, I, I think we're good. So uh, I have, uh, what would you recommend they watch in terms of videos? You've been interviewed many times, and, 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 and including Legends and Legacies. They, they've been assigned that too. Or articles that you've written that maybe are more obscure. That you, you know, they, they, All right. They, my, my recommendation I, is I have a website called okay. mdavidmerrill.com. Uh, I have put some of these most important articles that I have written in my life on that website. Uh, there are also a number of uh, lectures more recently that I have given uh, that are available uh, mostly on YouTube, I think. Uh, and so I would recommend you go to that website. Uh, I do, there's one little book that I've been talking to people about today that was on my previous website. And when I moved my website, I forgot to put it on. It's called Write Your Dissertation First and Other Essays on a Graduate Education. It's a series of essays. Uh, that I, uh, when I was in the midst of training graduate students, uh, I said to my graduates, when I, I'd like to have a meeting at my house on Thursday nights uh, for anybody that wants to come and we'll discuss your dissertation or we'll discuss research and we may even assign somebody to bring a topic. And I said, but just every Thursday, we'll just meet and have hot chocolate and sit by the mm -hmm. fireplace and just chat. And uh, then what I started to do is to tell stories uh, here about my experience uh, and uh, then I put those stories into a little book, which is never published, but it's been on my website, mm -hmm. called Write Your Dissertation First. And the reason that came to that is, uh, students said, what, what do you mean, write your dissertation first? I said, well, let me tell you, when a student comes to my office and said, 
I'd like you to be my chairman for mm -hmm. my dissertation. I said, okay, uh, I'll pick, uh, can you bring me your first draft next week? <laughs> and they said, no, I don't have a topic yet. <laughs> I said, well, then you have to hustle a little bit. Won't you? <laughs> and they said, well, will you be my chairman? I said, no, not until I see your first draft. I said, because I don't know, you know, whether I want to be your chairman yeah, or not. Yeah. And I said, and they said well, I can't. I said, yeah, you can. I said, I want you to write whatever you can. I said, if you don't have some question, burning question, then you're never going to get your PhD. You better have some question you want to answer. It may change, mm -hmm. but I want you to, and I don't want you to everything you know about it at this point in time, what you're thinking about and so forth. Write it down and bring it to me. Mm -hmm. And I said, then we'll go from there. Mm -hmm. And so, and then what I told them is I said, get your dissertation out of the way. Then I'll tell you one other story. Mm -hmm. And I, I told the story to me, I can't remember, I told it here. Um, Ron Axtell was a student in our graduate program who was a reader. Uh, he said he went all the way through school reading by compulsion. I only read things that was asked to read. And he said, I felt cheated. He said, so I decided to read by, by inclination. And so he read three or four or five books a week. Mm -hmm. uh, and just what he wanted to read. Mm -hmm. And then we had a little poster. He had a little a bulletin board he made for himself. The book of the week. Mm -hmm. I recommend for you to read. Yeah. And then you had another little poster that said the vocabulary word. Mm -hmm. Well, he was a very interesting guy and very bright, mm -hmm. of course. Well, he went to see a classic scholar on campus. Uh, Hugh Nibley is uh, one of these scholars that knew about 40 languages mm -hmm. and wrote in Mesopotamia yeah. and, you know, read old stuff, you know, and, and so forth. And uh, but now I forgot what Ron was asking, but he went to his office and he had his office and he said every wall that didn't have a window in it was lined with a bookshelf and every bookshelf had a, a shoebox on it. And so when he got through this discussion, he said to Dr. Nibley, Dr. Nibley, what are in all those boxes? And Nibley said two things, those things I agree with and those things I don't. And, and Ron says, mm -hmm. that's everything. And he said, no, no, dear boy, most things are worth considering. <laughs> and so the moral of the story is, and I used to tell this to my graduate students, that ought to be your theme as well. And if you don't know what your dissertation is going to be from day one, how do you know what to pay attention to? Mm -hmm. You know, so if you have a question, you know where you're going. And when you get in a class and you say, oh, that's relevant. Oh, that's, no, I disagree with that. I don't care about that. I said, because you can't learn everything. You can't do everything. So, you know, if, so concentrate on those things you agree with and those things you don't. Uh, so that's kind of stories that are in the old book. All right, well, Jing Wan and Fong and Michael, you better get starting to write your dissertations. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Bianca, Sino. So I think all three of us should say a thank you. I, I think Maynard would want to start. So. Yeah, thank you so much for the great conversation. I think my student uh, Dan and Anne also, also benefited a lot and also other uh, audience here. Thank Thanks you. So and thank you all for participating. Thank you for the opportunity. I love yes. to, you know. Yeah, thank you so much. I, for I don't mind telling stories. So. <laughs> it's, got, it's given us a chance to, to get to know you and, and a little bit about the background when we read about your theories and kind of your perspective. It'll, it'll couch all of that into um, your voice and your experience. And I think that'll really help. Good. I want to shake your hand here on <laughs> right, right. camera. So, uh, and I'm sure all my students do as well. We have a lot of Indiana people who came. Some some are working right now. It's three hours earlier yeah, than mine. Yeah, yeah. So, or three hours later, <laughs> three hours later. Yeah, uh, later. back in Indiana, but it's sort of mid afternoon there. And some came and some left. Some are here. Thank you all for coming. And if any of you get to St. George, I have an absolutely fabulous model railroad. You're certainly welcome to come and take a ride. <laughs> ah, that's Utah. That's Utah, St. George, Utah. Yeah, not St. George Island. I was in Florida, I said St. George, and they said, oh, you have a house on the island? And I said, what island? Yeah. Well, this has been wonderful today. Thank, thank you all. Can you have a virtual handshake for Dr. Merrill? Or yes. In the, in the chat window? Uh, High five. High five. <laughs> Michael. You want to put three words from today's session in the chat window? That'd be great. But otherwise, everybody wave, and thanks a lot. Thanks for participating, you guys. Yeah.